Hello and welcome to the Life Magnetics Podcast. I am your host, Crystal Ann Compton, and as ever, I am excited to be here with you. Today, I have something really wonderful to share with you. This is an interview that I recently did with Kim Curtis from Denver, Colorado. Now, Kim Curtis is an interesting person because in this conversation, we talk a lot about money and we talk about how to handle money, how to think about money, how to clear issues that we have around money. And again, I say unto you, it's just so interesting to me how I have of late been attracting these thought leaders around money. And, you know, I've, I found, uh, I found Kim to be really wonderful. There's something like really earthy and grounded in her spirit and in the way that she speaks because she's helping us with the 3d reality of money and how to think about it and also how to use it and plan for it. But she's also really connected in that way that I'd call 5d, which is, you know, to the spirit world. And she understands that everything is just energy and that it's about what we attract to us or repel from us with our own energy, which, by the way, is dictated by our thoughts, how we think about things, including money, and also how we feel about ourselves first. Not even really how we feel about money, although, of course, that's important, but how we feel about money really is a reflection of how we feel about ourselves, worthiness, you know, sovereignty, creative or creativity, um, that sense of entitlement, not in a bad way, but like I'm entitled to live a life that is thriving. Like that's how we feel about ourselves, how all of these things truly are interconnected and how money shows up according to how we think and feel about ourselves. And so we just have a really great conversation. And toward the end of the episode, she actually gives us some information about how to plan for the future 2023 and beyond. And I will say, this is very practical, pragmatic information from a financial advisor. Normally, you know, right-brained crystal is like, I'm over here in the astral already. You know, I, blah, 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 let my husband deal with that. But um, because of the way Kim talks about it and because she's connected in both realms, I really like, I really received an education and I really want to encourage you no matter like how you feel about the subject of money and financial planning and your future and what's coming and how to feel about yourself in the midst of all that. I really encourage you to listen to this entire episode and hear what she is saying because I think it's really important. Okay. Before we get into it, I just want to remind you, I've got a text community, honey. Yes, I do. If you want to stay connected to me, Crystal Ann Compton, and know what's going on in my life, what cool things are happening, what offers I've got, but also just what I'm thinking, et cetera, then you want to make sure that you go to textcac.com. That's textcac.com. Uh, you can just send a quick text, connect to my community, and be one of the first people to know about what's going on with me. All right. Without further ado, let's get into today's episode with Kim Curtis. Kim Curtis is a nationally recognized wealth management advisor, speaker, president, and CEO of Wealth Legacy Institute. She is also the best-selling author of Money Secrets, Keys to Smart Investing and Retirement Secrets. Kim takes a holistic approach to money and believes that how you deal with money says a lot about how you deal with life. Welcome, Kim, to the Life Magnetics Podcast. I'm really excited you're here. Me too. Thank you. Let's do this. Yes. Well, I just feel like it's interesting because I've had a lot of conversations lately with people in the money consciousness arena. And I feel like that's because we need experts and guides talking about it right now on the planet, because I really feel and I hear from people who are in various states of anxiety or fear, what's happening, inflation, gas prices, you know, 2023 recession, and there's everybody's worried. And as a spiritual person, the first thing I will say is that having fear and worry is like not what you want to have when you want to manifest and, and open up the wellspring of something like money. So mm -hmm. I'm glad you're here for that reason, because I'd like you to speak Thank to all you. of that. But before we get to it, I just want to learn <laughs> about you, because I noticed with guests who have developed expertise that they started in life without any of that. <laughs> and so they, mm. they go on a path that led them to amassing resources and learning. So tell us about who you were before you became this financial expert. Yeah. So I appreciate that. Thank you. So I actually 
ended up in finance from a quiz. Okay. Believe it or not. I have a legal background. And my legal background took me, my area of expertise is negotiation, mediation, arbitration. And um, I moved up in the ranks and I reported ultimately to the president of that company in New York City. And what I realized is that I was no longer making a difference in people's lives. I became a spokesperson. And so at 30, I actually have, of course, who doesn't have friends in HR that could put you through a bunch of assessments and financial planning, finance came up as a career shift. And so that's how I ended up in finance. Okay. But what makes that so interesting, the furthest thing that you would guess for someone like me is that when I was a teenager, my parents got divorced and she ended up with full custody of three teenage girls. And she had no employable skills. So she applied for and received government assisted lunches. And so I had this little red ticket of shame Mm -hmm. that I had to hand to that cashier and look behind me right before, you know, as I moved my tray down and hid that little ticket under my plate and quickly uh, pass that off to her uh, before hoping no one would see it. So that unworthiness, that who am I started at 14, 15. And then, but my mom said to her daughters uh, that go get your education because no one can take that away from you. So we did. I went to undergrad and then law school and within six months of graduating defaulted on my school loans. Okay. Yeah. So I had no business uh, having anything to do with money. I was completely unconscious around money and had no understanding of that default on my credit. Hmm. But something amazing happened. So I had an anonymous donor put a thousand dollars, a thousand. Now, back in the day, in today's dollars, that debt was around 92,000 to give an example of how big it was back then. Wow. Uh, put a thousand dollars on my school loan debt. And the fact that I was unconscious and I actually opened the statement, who does that when we have debt? Your, your listeners and viewers could probably appreciate some of that. Mm-hmm. But I actually opened it and saw that that balance went down, not up. To me, that thousand was like a million in terms of what that was at the time and my understanding or lack of understanding of money. But because it was anonymous, I could not go, oh no, or why me? Or, you know, learn more about that. So I had to have that conversation with myself. And so it was, if someone believes in me, who is it that they believe in? Mm. And what do I believe in? And who do I want to be? Wow. So I know it it was almost like an, it was almost like a snap uh, because it was a wellspring of emotions. And I think it started with Mm self-respect and then I think it went to kind of trusting in me. And then it was ultimately, it was really love. The vibration of that went to love and, and it allowed me to understand that, wow, I am a hundred percent responsible for the outcomes in my life. What choices am I going to make moving forward through self-respect and being conscious of my choices in life uh, do I want to make? And so from that point on, it was really a journey, but it started with understanding that I am responsible for the outcomes in my life. I am creative enough to know that I will get those outcomes that I put out there for. And that was a big leap, but for whatever reason, it took me to that high level to be ma- to be able to take it to that next step. That's like such a cornerstone faith and belief to have in yourself. I think a lot of people don't. And I just love the miraculous nature of being gifted something like that, lending itself to um, developing that kind of faith in yourself and in life. Um, did you ever find out who it was? <laughs> I actually did. You did. I actually did. Um, and it was a woman who was about a, a 10 years older than me. And she attended the same uh, church that I attended. And she, she didn't even have it to give. And a decade later, when I was in finance, so the twenties were crazy, terrible shit show, you name it. Mm-hmm. Uh, then the thirties, I started to get responsible with my job and everything. Um, 
so I was in finance at the time and I looked her up and she still happened to be, I live in Denver, Colorado. She, mm -hmm. she, that weekend was having a yard sale to sell all of her stuff, to move to Philadelphia, where I think her mother lived and that she was going back to take care of her aging mother. Um, and I had an envelope in my pocket. I usually never tell this side of the story. Um, and, and that envelope had, um, I'll just tell you, it had $5,000 in it. And ah, oh, she needed that at that time. And she must've been putting out signals that I happened to hear um, mm -hmm. and was able to give her that. And I, ah, I, oh, I shared with her that the, as an entrepreneur, the business that I created and the jobs that I created and that this was for her with interest paid. Oh my gosh, I've got goosebumps. <laughs> and isn't that way that this is the way the universe works. And I think it's the science of getting rich with, is it Wallace Waddles, um, where he talks mm -hmm. about always making sure to add a little bit more extra in whatever you're doing, especially if you're in the service industry in any way, just a 15 to 20% more than somebody would expect just to keep that abundant cycle flowing and in circulation so it comes back to you even more and then you give even more and i think i love the idea i grew up as a fundamentalist christian christian <laughs> i am no longer a fundamentalist christian um, but you know the idea of tithing and the 10 percent and i did that all my uh teenage life and in my 20s and when i left the church I still kind of felt energetically it was important to find ways to give at least a portion of whatever i was getting in to somebody in need now i don't personally think I need to give that to a big rich church and a pastor who's got like a Benz, but like people in your life, this woman noticed that about you or felt that about you. And then you turned around and felt that about her. I consider that to be a spiritual tithe, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's, that's really beautiful. Yeah. Thank you for asking me the back end of that story. Yeah. I think that just demonstrates the cycle that we're talking about. Now, I know that you say that a person's relationship with money has to start on the inside. And of course, you were gifted this. This kind of reflected a new version of who somebody thought you were. You know, and you, kind of, <laughs> right. you could hook into that and say, yeah, I am that and go mm -hmm. from there. Mm -hmm. Do you have any advice for people who are kind of in a darker place right now? maybe they're they don't have a lot in their bank account they don't know how to generate a lot in their bank account and they have to create that relationship within themselves where they see themselves that way how can they begin to do that just even one or two steps yeah i, I think it, it really starts with what are your beliefs that you have and obviously many of them are limiting we're surrounded in it we're in a culture in it that and our family background so so i would start with the question well actually we neuroscience, we all have these little receptors to help us identify what the body needs. So from antigens to sunlight to you name it. So if we could turn that receptor to money, what would that tell us? Hmm. And it would tell us that you're wired for money because your body will always tell you what you need. So if you're wired for money, what is it that's, that's visceral around it that allow, that blocks you or makes it hard to, to be successful around money? And I would start with, and I, I think I'll just say this and then come back to that question, because what I, what I tell people all the time, I need more money, I need money, I'm in debt. Well, yes, you are if you continue to say that, because money needs you. Money is looking for you. So if your receptors aren't triggered. <laughs> I love that. Okay. Then money will never find you. So how do you trigger your money receptor so that, mo that you're attractive and magnetic enough for money to find you? Now, to the listeners and viewers, when we say that money is looking for you, the question is, what was your reaction? Was your reaction skeptical? Like, what is she talking about? She has no idea what it's like. Or were you curious, instantly curious, knowing that maybe there's something here that they may learn from our conversation? That's your first indicator of what that receptor may be. If you were skeptical, you need to unpack that story of what, why did you feel skeptical? Because if you think we, we, we all have reactions when we think of when a, a Ferrari drives down the road um, or a Lamborghini, do you like stop and go, wow, look at that beauty. My son would take a picture, mm -hmm. but someone else would go, who would spend that much money on a car? So what is that conversation? Are you excited, intrigued, or how lucky are they? Or are you, what a waste of money? Or even someone that's on the street asking for money. Do you cross the street 
and in disgust? Or do you have compassion and want to do something about it? So those are the starting points of unpacking what some of those limiting beliefs may be. And then also think about what are the, your first money memories that you had as a child? Hmm. And then did your family talk about money? Hmm. When was the first, like for me, one of my first things was I got a bike and I paid for it. Like I remember that banana bike, you know, with the green seats and the sissy bars and that bike was everything to me because I worked for it. Um, so think about those things to help figure out what are those beliefs and they may not even be yours. Those limiting beliefs may be generations before you. It could be great grandpa was a tightwad and now you're the tightwad or spent everything they ever had and you feel the same way because you've never been demonstrated or modeled that behavior. And it's not your fault. It's not wow. your fault at all. It's once you recognize that and call it out and then decide who do you want to be in that area. Okay. That was a long answer. No, There's it's probably a, it's, three different things in there. It's a good answer. And it sounds like you really have to set an intention to become conscious to like your inner scripts and programming. I actually had an exercise that I've been working with for years personally to just gauge where I am with prosperity because I come from abject poverty, like Roll pot, no running water, no electricity, living in the jungle of Hawaii growing up. Um, it was very, very poor. And my parents modeled that to me. And so I have always been kind of aware and, and working with this. And one technique that I used was to intentionally consider, well, what if you won the lottery? What if you won $100 million? And then what's your reaction to that? And at first it'd be, wow, that's so awesome. But then I would notice yeah, but everybody would want it. Oh, and I would have to be in hiding. Oh, and I couldn't tell anybody. And oh, I would have to make sure I got the most, I wouldn't want, like all these things I started, that. I, I all these that. things, like these things that I would have to do to protect the money would indicate to me, whoa, you've got some issues some around scarcity money. scarcity issues. Yeah, and I would Win, say, lose. Yeah. if you want to like become conscious to, to, one of, to whether you have some of this patterning, just kind of get into a little bit of a meditation and then ask your question, ask the question, what if I won the $100 million lottery and just see the gyrations, the energetic and mental gyrations that you go through. Maybe like your son, you're like, yeah, and they take a picture. That's going to be so awesome. <laughs> but I think a lot of us would immediately be cast into fear and anxiety. So a lot of people talk about that. like having a money mindset, mm -hmm. right? And that to me sounds like changing the way you think. I think there's a difference between changing the way you think and also how you feel about yourself, right? Mm -hmm. I think one leads to the other. What do you think a money mindset is and how can somebody begin to have one, a good money mindset? We all probably have one already. Mm -hmm. So in the beginning of the podcast, you talked about uh, one of the things I say is how you do money is how you do life. So if your head is in the sand on money, your head is in the sand on other areas of your life. So to the if you... Think of a flashlight and in that flashlight, let's say there are four batteries to light up that light. And that first battery is the money energy battery because money is an invisible thread that impacts every piece of what we do. It's involved in every aspect of our life as an invisible thread. And then that next is, well, the next three are, you think of spirit, mind, and body. And all of those, money is infiltrating through the energy of that one body, then in the, of the mind, and then the spirit. And out comes the light. And that light is your life. Mm -hmm. And the success or struggle that you have in your life. Now, the energy circuits that are in each of those batteries need to be charged or they go dead. They fade out. So at birth, there's a part of our mindset around money that's given to us. It's almost like a head start. For me, it wasn't a head start. I've done some of those evaluations. Um, and mine was very small in terms of having financial success. And, uh, and for others, they have a blueprint that's high, more likely to succeed around money. So if you think of that as a, and that's usually by age three, Mm -hmm. And then by, you know, seven to 15, then we start to do life experiences. And then all of a sudden we trigger that stored money energy to work in our favor or not, because if we haven't done anything between now and then, or we start to learn about money and become smarter about money. So all of a sudden that battery charges up 
that stored energy from what was given to us earlier and then what we add to it to make it brighter. And so when we think about our relationships, uh, our health, our spiritual grounding, all of those come from that initial first battery. Mm. So, so what do we do to bring that energy up? Yes. And tap into that money mindset. So, so we talked about that it initially starts with self-respect, at, at least for me, and that money receptor. So I could explain, and I did explain how it happened to me, so that maybe that could be, that's helpful to some of the listeners and viewers that that may be helpful to them. But I'll describe it as a story of one of our clients, and maybe that is more helpful to understand how they can bring it forward. Okay. So Anne became a client, but prior to that, her goal was to have who doesn't want this? A million dollars, retire, step off and do what she loves. Like that's kind of the American, seems like mm -hmm. the American dream. Um, and so what she, and relax and step off. So she, she saved a little bit. She put, invested with mixed results, but every time she tried to do what she loved and relax, she got interrupted by duties and obligations and other people. And she loved to write. She wrote when she was younger and was good at it. And that's what she really wanted to do. And as she shared this story with me about how she always got interrupted with other people's obligations and her duties, it was like, does she realize what she's saying? That she doesn't even respect herself to let other people interrupt her. So what she thought is that, we, so that, okay, if I'm not gonna have the million dollars, how do I act like that already exists? How do I act like if I had it, similar to what you said about the lottery, you, you were right on track. So she started to act. If she, if she had the money that she needed, how, she would relax and she would start writing more and more. And as she wrote, she got better and better and better at it. But it started with her giving herself permission to do those things. And particularly as women and men, it's hard to give permission. We usually give to others and we're the last on the list. So that's the most very first thing is to put yourself first, kind of like the the on the airplane, put the oxygen mask on first before someone else. You have to do that first. And if you don't, then the money consciousness, you will never identify with it. It will never be there for you because your battery is not strong enough. So as a result, she became actually a best-selling author and had more money than she ever could have dreamed of because she finally put in perspective first her needs, self-respect, that allowed her then to be creative and have more ideas and more imaginative because it hit that higher flow of frequencies that then allowed her to be able to write in a way that became a bestseller book. Amazing. So I'll, is that helpful through Anne's story? Absolutely. Very helpful. Yes. And it kind of coincides with what uh, Joseph Campbell said when he said, follow your bliss, like do the things. And Bashar says, follow your highest excitement. Like we get excited in levels, but your highest excitement is the doorway to the thing that you're supposed to be doing. And when you finally align with that, I believe the universe opens up to support and propel you forward. So yes, it makes a lot of sense. But Pete, you're right with women, though, we have this I think ancestral stigma, we've got these, the, the construct of society, like who we are, what we're supposed to do, our roles, which I feel like we're trying to break out of at this time in Earth's history. But do women just generally relate to money differently than men? It just seems harder for women to mm -hmm. kick down or kick through those doors and um, be powerful with money. Why is that, do you think, or do you agree or not agree? No, it's really true. I, I... I mean, a lot of it is cultural and society and even govern, government's uh, structures. I mean, if you think about thousands of years ago, that did not exist. It, we, and we didn't even need money as we understand it today. So we've evolved through the creation of money. It has no meaning other than the meaning we give it. Okay. And it was created for global exchange by men. So if you think about why women don't necessarily buy into the investing aspect of it, um, there's a reason the languaging is linear. It's a goal, you achieve it, you buy the house, you get your car, you have the career, you have your children, and hopefully you get to security or freedom. So it's step by step with a goal where the other side 
uh, of money. There's actually two laws of money. The one is I just explained it. It's the human made laws. It's what I do every day. It's, it's financial planning, cash flow management, portfolio construction, retirement planning, tax mitigation. The other side of money is natural money laws. And the natural money laws are around us and we have them inside of us, all of us. And we've lost sight of those natural money laws. And we talked about earlier, the, it, it, let me explain what some of those are. One is giving and receiving. Mm-hmm. And that's what happened to me. That, that energy of that frequency rose, uh, leveled up that I could be at a place to make a difference and change my direction. So if giving and receiving, cause and effect, supply and demand, intention and desire, community, compassion, even mercy and justice. Those are all community, you know, family. Those are all things that generally as women, we relate to. Mm-hmm. And that's actually where money starts. Because remember I said money is looking for you. Yes. And the only way money can find you is that if you have ideas and vision and values that are in alignment with your passion, mm-hmm. you nailed it. That is the gateway. Doing what you love. Who doesn't? We love our families. We want the best for our families to do what we love um, in alignment with our vision and values and goals and, and what's inside. So if we understand as women that the natural money laws are already inside of us, and that's where we start to have a money mindset, to mm-hmm. know that all those things are part of money, because remember, money has no meaning by itself. The only meaning it has is what we give to it. So money needs your ideas and your vision and your values and what's important to you tied to the natural money laws. Amazing. (laughs) So yeah, so money is a tool and the money, the tool serves you, you do not serve the tool. And so it's like the importance um, that people place on money, you got to switch it up, right? It's here to serve you. I was going to ask you whether you thought money was inherently spiritual. I realize that it doesn't, it doesn't sound, it's whatever value we ascribe to it. So, but it's, it's for you, it may be right. Well, let's cook. Maybe like, let me ask you a question about that. Um, I am in touch with a lot of spiritual people, spiritual practitioners who like are energy healers or they, you know, they meet with people and uh, they do their different businesses, but they have this, I see it across the board. They have this idea that, well, because it's spiritual or because it's, it's good, I shouldn't charge anything for it. Or I'm going to charge the bare minimum because if it's from God, if it's from spirit, it should be free. Like that's what people, people actually say that. You know, well, why are you charging for this? Because isn't spirit free? How do people start to reframe their idea, especially spiritual people who are in business for themselves, reframe this idea that they shouldn't charge what they're worth? Yeah, that really is unpacking the myth around, oh, money is dirty or money is not spiritual or I need to do this for free because it's my natural gift. So so that's disrespecting money. Hmm. Yeah. Because because remember, it's not that you need money, money needs you. And so by charging appropriately, it provides for you and your family to have more of what they need for you to then give it in a way to others or provide more value in your services in a bigger, greater way. So you're denying the universe your ability to get your abundance to give by not charging for something that is valuable. Yes. Thank you. So it's, it's by, by doing that, it's disrespectful to the energy of money and the energy, which means you're blocking that the battery to fuel those other three areas of your mm-hmm. life, to have a life, the light of that, of that flashlight to shine bright on other areas. Right. I, okay. Uh, that's good. Now here, here's a one area that I think we maybe want to drill down into and and we talked about becoming conscious to the way that you feel and think about money the lottery and the other examples that you offered so somebody becomes conscious and aware that yeah i got an issue around this this is a problem Mm -hmm. um what can they do to i know what can they do to actually change it somebody might say affirmations somebody might say um study learning fellowship like what are some things that people can do to change how they feel inherently about money i mean i realize i have a problem now what yeah. So remember, it starts with natural law and yep. inside you first. So remove the limiting beliefs, unpack how? it. How? How? We already talked about how. Okay. We talked about, about 
what is your receptor when we talked about uh, rich people, poor people, or how other people spend money? Mm -hmm. We talked about if you had a lottery, if you won it, what mm -hmm. are the things that you would do? And what are the stories? When was your first observation of money in your household? And do you have one? And if so, what was it? And is it yours? So those are the ways that you ask a series of questions to unpack whatever that stuff is that's blocking you. And then when you move forward, which is your question, mm -hmm. I think, um, how do you make that happen? So it always starts in the natural money laws of raising that frequency of your vibration around money. So uh, being be, following your passion. So do what you love and get paid for it appropriately. Um, giving and receiving, we talked about that. So it's kind of like people that have a lot of money that don't understand natural money laws are not happy. Hmm. People that understand natural money laws and have not done anything in the human made laws don't, are broke. Mm -hmm. but they may be happy, sort of, because remember money affects all those other things. So if you start on the natural money laws, which is already inherently in you, and then start to do steps to learn the human made laws, because you need actually both in harmony. And so start reading books on money, uh, start doing a small step. Small step is, is in terms of the natural money laws is actually getting a handle on your spending mm. and creating a spending plan. It's not lying to yourself or not opening up your bills. It's being honest, head up. What's my reality? What initial steps am I going to do today? One day at a time to get out of debt. How much? So you, you create the spending plan and you actually put all your bills down What's the interest rate? How much the payment? What's the minimum payment? And create a game plan around that. Once you shine light, that flashlight shines light on that. And you recognize, so you pay the, the smallest balance first, perhaps even maybe that before the higher interest rate, because it gives you more motivation. And once you pay that off, put it to the next one and pay the minimum payment on the others. And then know within 24 months or whatever, I am going to be out of debt with this with this credit card debt or whatever the school loan debt or whatever it is. But instead we think it's going to go away. And once you start to do that, it's like a muscle. You start to get empowered and excited when that credit card balance is done and you go to the next one or that car payment, you are more motivated to, I think I have another more, I have another 10 bucks. And it's so much easier than to make trade-offs for yourself because you have a plan and you're sticking to it. And that momentum ultimately leads to financial success because you know how long it took you to get out of debt. You know that $10, $20, $50 took that much time and it was suffocating. And when you understand the freedom of taking control of your life, then all of a sudden you have more momentum to learn more about the human made laws of money. Okay. So let me clarify why I asked the way I did. Um, and I, yeah. I heard all that. That's also good. And I love that. I love the action steps of that. <clears throat> Um, when you unpack where your money issues come from, like you get back to the first time you ever felt anything about money and you can also identify where in your life, you know, maybe it was programmed into you, these fallacies um, and false beliefs about money. And then you recognize that. Are, are you saying that completes the process of the healing? No, of it? it's ongoing. <laughs> okay. Because for me, for me, I just want to say for me in that moment, what I would do as a spiritual person, I would insert something in that moment. Ah, I recognize, mm -hmm. I feel that. Now let me bring in the truth because the only thing that undo undoes a lie, which a false belief is a lie, is the truth. And so having some sort of an, a money affirmation or some sort of a truth nugget to insert into that moment when I make the connection, I think is how we begin to start to reprogram, right? And then also training the mind in the way that you think. That is what I was kind of drilling down into. And then from there, maybe taking these action steps that you're talking about, which are so valuable. Really important, Crystal, because that's your background to understand how to actually put in that different belief mm -hmm. that's truth to knock it off. And thank you for that clarity. That's really important. No, yeah, that's just um, a little add on that I would that I would um, offer. It's also good. I wanted to I wanted to know I'm super curious. Do you have like any interesting little simple money rituals? Like some people put like the number 8 in their wallet because they think that'll draw money to them. Some people like count their money and I they say I love you to each dollar bill. You know, people can get really really cosmic right. with it. Do you have any like rituals like that that you do? 
not quite in the way that you're describing, but I do keep a copy of the red ticket because that red ticket was very simple. It looked yeah. like this. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I keep one of these in my wallet. That's awesome. That's symbolic. That's emblematic. It's charged. I love totally that. charged. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. With your, your feeling and your belief. It's like all in that little beautiful symbol. The affirmations are really, really important and intentions. Uh, those are so important as we are building up our muscle, our money muscle. Yeah. Uh, to make sure that you continue to do that. And the money muscle is really around you about worthiness and that deserving and life is abundant and there's more than enough and I have all that I need. Yes. I am a magnet for money, honey. That, that's right. That's yours. Mm -hmm. I can tell just by how you said that mm -hmm. that's you could see. So as viewers to see your energy, how it shifted mm -hmm. big deal. So do you ever stand in front of a mirror and do you say that to yourself, looking in your eyeballs like Louise Hay did? <laughs> <laughs> well, Jack Canfield also talks about the mirror exercise. And I have to say that I have not done that. Mm -hmm. But do you realize how hard that is? Yeah. Do you do it? Because it's probably mm -hmm. really helpful. I do it not in the necessarily in the area of money, but in other areas that um, I need to speak to myself like very deeply about things that exist inside of me. And it is when you look in your own eyes you are transported into your soul space. And that is so intense. It can be really, really intense. Sometimes you don't even have to say anything, you just have to be present and look, look upon, you know? And mm. I think, yeah, so I think that is, and then inserting an affirmation is really, really powerful. Um, mm. I so, you're, bumps. so you are, you know, you're in the financial field of the mm -hmm. 3D financial world. And <laughs> <laughs> as we started, as we started, we, we talked about like all of the fears that so many of us have, you know, mm -hmm. and, and rightly so, because the world, the outpictured reality, as Neville Goddard would say, it looks a little crazy on the screen of life at this time. Mm -hmm. So yeah. can we ask, I know you're not a prognosticator, but like mm -hmm. looking upon 2023, is there anything that we should know, keep in mind? Um, as we are working with money, opening up to money, um, anything that you see coming down the pike that we should be aware of, any advice for us for the future? Yeah. Um, whew, I'll answer it and then I'll come back. Okay. So hang on, hang on. A lot of forces are moving in different ways and we're not out of the woods. Um, based on the Federal Reserve and the interest rate hikes that are continued to becoming. So, so what I mean by that is, but it's all irrelevant. The short term issues around money and politics and governance and GDP and all the different things, inflation that take us off course are irrelevant to you and your success with money, believe it or not. Okay. So let me explain. Okay. When I think of, uh, working like in our, for our firm, uh, People come to us to manage money. They have money, they want it managed. So if you think of a pyramid, kind of like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the bottom is um, food, clothing, shelter in Maslow's and the top is self-actualization. Well, in our firm, the bottom is managing money. And the next line of that four uh, levels is uh, achieving your goals. So you need to have financial planning with money, the investing of money, because otherwise, uh, investing is like archery without a bullseye. Mm -hmm. You have nothing to compare it to. So when you see the capital markets go down 15, 20%, maybe even bigger, depending on what you were invested in, um, it feels absolutely terrifying. But when you put it to a financial plan, how does that impact you specifically? Why do we have a plan? The plan is for longer term goals so that we have choices and freedom later. So everything is a long-term focus. So hypothetically, if that person had a 6,000 a month lifestyle and they're down 15, 20%, the plan says instead of 6,000 a month, all through life expectancy, net spending, it's 5,900 a month. Does that make you feel a little comfortable? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what happened to the Great Recession. None mm -hmm. of our clients capitulated because they recognized when they went back to the financial plan, Oh, it's like, oh, okay. When I look at my statement, it feels terrible. Well, then don't look at your statements because we're, and these are people that are already retired, living off their money, but we have this whole long time frame around it because this is a cyclical, because remember natural laws, money ebbs and flows. Yes. And during the ebb, 
for us, it's a time to do self-development, to improve your skills, learn something. Just like during the pandemic, I think a lot of people ended up doing extra things to get better or to have different career choices. That's what you do in the ebbs with money as you work on yourself and build your business or what you're working on. So sorry, but back no. to that pyramid, um, you need the two together, investing and planning to put, to put peace of mind, which is that next level on that pyramid. It's lifestyle. When you have those two things together, investing with a financial plan, you have lifestyle because money is frenetic. It, it's, you know, but our job is to put it down here to support your foundation. And then all of a sudden, there's nothing in front of you anymore. You're on a solid ground so that you have peace of mind and you're living the life that's important to you. And once you finally have peace of mind, the pinnacle of that pyramid is impact. Or another word could be legacy. Mm -hmm. So if you think about what's happening in 2023 in the capital markets, all of that is so irrelevant to you and who you are. What is your impact in the world? What are you doing to grow towards that, to be in alignment with passion and purpose, mm -hmm. to make a difference in the world? Because if you think of that money, if, if in fact, yes, money is looking for you, what ideas do I have for it? Oh, good question. Ideas are abundant. And you have your skills. And so you think of ideas, ideas, ideas. Many of them may be crap, but you have may have one or two good ideas. And then what do you do? Quickly move on it. And then course correct, course correct, course correct. So focus on what you can control, you. Ignore the capital markets because they're going to be crazy uh, just in the short term. It could be a couple of years. We don't know, but it usually takes a while to kind of get back out of it. Um, ignore the news and the media. We call that in our industry, uh, financial propaganda or financial pornography or however you want to describe it. It mm -hmm. does nothing to help you. Mm -hmm. It does everything to get you off track. Yes. And your track is who are you? How do you show up? What is the long-term understanding of who you want to be? And there are hourly financial planners out there that you could bring into your life to have them give you a map to run on. So that when things like this occur, you stay disciplined and focused. Because the worst thing you can do in down markets is, is bail. And those of you who have retirement plans or 401k plans and have an automatic paycheck going into it, you love down markets. You hope it's down for three years while you're contributing to it because it's like shopping on sale. Hmm. I mean, for those that are retired, they don't like down markets, but people that are growing and and have a retirement plan or create a retirement plan. They could, uh, entrepreneurs can create solo 401ks or they could do a Roth or an individual IRA. There's all kinds of options with small amounts of money that you could set up and continue to fund and don't change the allocation during down markets. You need to stay in equities, especially if you have long, 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 long time. Cause that's oh the only gosh. way you're gonna stay ahead of taxes and inflation. I have a friend I was just talking to over Thanksgiving who had about uh, 2 million in his retirement fund and he checked it and he's like, I'm down to $800,000. And when I tell you I had a bottle, a bottle of whiskey, he's like, I'm just like, but I mean, I'm just like, but it's going to turn back around. I mean, I've heard this from you a couple of times in the last two decades. It's going to be okay. But yeah, it's such a pain point to actually look at it. And so don't look at it. That's, that's the advice. Don't, don't look, look at, at it. it. Just stay with it. Don't bail. Don't sell. Just stay with it. There's one more key if we're diving into the weeds here. Mm -hmm. The key around that is to have a globally diversified index portfolio, not individual stocks, mm -hmm. okay. not cryptocurrency. Oh my God, uh, I wanted to ask you about FTX, but I, I won't. <laughs> to have a globally diversified portfolio. Uh, uh, and you know, Vanguard and some of these other companies have these indexes that'll and to have international, to have domestic, um, to have some fixed income as your stabilizer, which are bonds, most stocks, bonds, cash. Mm -hmm. And as a starting point for uh, someone that is, say, 50, it may be 60 in stocks, 40 in bonds. So for a younger person, it may be 80, 20 stocks, bonds, if they can handle it, 95, 5 in fixed income, because the fixed income is your stabilizer and you have all this time. The key is to tie it to a plan, because if you don't, you're more likely to not keep your seat on the bus. So it's not capital markets that fail, it's human behavior that fails. 
Mm. Wow. Truth bombs all throughout this. So if so, if somebody feels like, well, I don't have money now, how am I going to afford a financial planner? What you're saying is there are hourly people that are can be affordable that you can find just to help you get started with your initial plan. And everybody mm -hmm. should do that. Everyone should do that. Uh, there's a, a couple of organizations. One is XY Planning, XY Planning. And there's another organization that does hourly planning. Um, and you may want to look into Zoe, Z-O-E. Zoe mm -hmm. Financial mm -hmm. to uh, for hourly planners. I'm going to just include that in the description of this podcast and the, the YouTube because I think that's helpful. You are amazing. You're a dynamo. And I love how <laughs> I love. No, you are. But I mean, there was so much content here, actually, that we can mm -hmm. we can get into. That was that was really wonderful. Thank you for that. And so how can people get in touch with you? Like what kind of services do you offer? I know you have this book, which again is Money Secrets, Keys to Smart Investing and Retirement Secrets, which by the way, I'm going to buy. I'm going to get off with you. I'm going to buy that. <laughs> I'm gonna I am going to I suggest everybody does, but do you do one-on-one -on -one stuff? Do you do workshops? Like what do you got going on? Yeah, I, I don't have that going on, but you know what I want to do? Mm. I, you know, Crystal, this is something that's very important to me. I want to create a prosperity immersive experience. Ooh, tell me about this. Well, if you think about, I don't know if you've gone to the Van Gogh immersive experience. So it's, mm -mm. it's an artist, one guy, who, and it's like all around. And when you are in it, you feel it. There's sensory issues around it. Imagine the excitement if that were on prosperity. Wow. I'm getting goosebumps everywhere. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, uh, for all, for all people, uh, to be able to experience this, because when we think of financial literacy, the people that need it the most don't have access. Yeah. And if we could create Think of all the sensories. Like, what would money smell like? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. What would abundance smell like? You know, get some music and some drumming, mm -hmm. get movement, and think about what that would look like. So that's one of the projects I'm working on. Uh, as a matter of fact, I just got off the phone with someone before our call regarding that. And it's kind of tied to similar to the secret, but take it to a younger, uh, more, you know, different Mm -hmm. who we are today. Because, well, you know, my son never even touches money. You know, mm -hmm. you know, it's all digital wallet and right. things like that. So money a decade from now will be even a very different conversation than it is that you and I are having, other than the fact that money is always looking for you. Matthew 18, 19 says, when two or more agree on something on earth, our father in heaven is compelled to create it. And so I'm going to agree with you on this because I think this is such an exciting, exciting project that everybody really, really needs. I think money literacy is so important. And I do think there are so many spiritual connotations, manifestation, epigenetics, ancestral line stuff. Like we need to, we need to get in alignment. So I think it's such a beautiful idea and I agree. You're going to create it. It's going to be fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. We're moving forward rather rapidly. Good. Good. That. Yeah, yeah. Money, lo money loves speed, according to Joe Vitale. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So on financialliteracypress.com, financialliteracypress.com, we have a lot of freebies that may be available, that will be available if your li listeners are interested. One is the 10 laws of money every investor should know. And the other is tax tips. And uh, that's also a link to uh, Money Secrets or Retirement Secrets, but you could get those two books on Amazon. And Money Secrets is powerful. That won four book awards. Oh, wow. It is like at the end of each chapter, thank you, questions that you should ask yourself or questions your financial advisor should be asking you. So it basically gives you financial armor so that when you do go meet with a financial advisor that you actually are in control. Okay, financialliteracy.com. Is that what financial you? literacy press press .com. thank you okay. for that clarification absolutely financial literacy okay i'll put that also in the link to the description um are you do you do public speaking are you giving uh, are you up on stages because you ought to be yeah you do yeah <laughs> <laughs> i do have a third book that's on its way out and that will be called money is looking for you Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I look forward to yeah. that. Thank you thank so you. very much again for this one wonderful interview. I hope that we can stay connected and I wish you so much success and joy in your future endeavors. Thank you. Back at you. Thanks, Crystal.